was a rumble in the jungle Once I heard dad was outside again Counting birds and mama plugged in the nightlight And I saw the queen of the world Welcome to the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. I am your co-host Liz and Natalie is here too. We're back with part two of Nicolette's birth story. Just a reminder that this episode contains discussions about a near-death experience during childbirth involving both mom and baby. The episode includes details about Nicolette's challenging and potentially distressing situation that may be triggering for some listeners. We want to provide a heads up to our listeners who may have a history of trauma or sensitivity to these topics and encourage self-care and support if needed. Although listener discretion is advised, we feel that Nicolette's story is very important and every birth story is deserving of respect. We honor and celebrate the diversity of each birth story, and we strive to provide a supportive and inclusive space for all birth stories on the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. Now we'll jump back into Nicolette's story. First, a little recap of part one. I'm a labor delivery nurse. My pregnancy with me was super easy. I wasn't sick. I loved being pregnant. It was pretty quick labor for a first-time mom. If I was on my deathbed, the one thing I would regret in my whole entire life is not having another baby. I wound up getting pregnant very quickly. I knew things could go wrong in pregnancies before I was a labor and delivery nurse, but then you then you know all the things that can go wrong. I started to develop this feeling that I could not shake. I said, I'm afraid I'm going to die in labor. I had a couple of extra ultrasounds, but everything was fine. They were like, you're completely healthy, healthy pregnancy, healthy mom, blah, 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 whatever. Let's start my injection. Then the night was like super uneventful. (laughs) They checked me and I wasn't really far along. And I'm like, that's weird because this is my second baby. I was like, ow. I screamed so loud. I did not recognize my own voice. And that's when I was like, this is it. This is what I said was going to happen. And all of a sudden, I couldn't see anymore. I couldn't hold up my body weight anymore. I felt like cement was running through my veins. What wound up happening was my splenic artery ruptured, but we didn't know that at the time. I was dying on the inside. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And I'm like yelling and I'm very myself up here, but like externally, I couldn't respond. I need to let them know that I'm dying because I know that I'm dying, but they don't know that I'm dying. And if I'm dying, then my son is dying. And then all of a sudden, I was just acutely aware of how much time was passing. And it really wasn't, I mean, from rupture to call to the OR was about eight minutes. It really, it really is not a long time. A stat C-section has to be done within, the baby has to be out within 30 minutes. So the problem was I was fighting. Lay down, Nicolette. And I would shoot up. I can't. I can't. What's wrong? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And they're like, Dr. Sykes, you can breathe. I have oxygen on you. So I'm like, no. Like, I I was like, how do I explain this? And I was like, my throat feels like it's closing. I can't breathe. So then I'm like, "Hmm," sitting up like, "Hmm," and they're like, you you know, certain things I had to lay down. And every time I lay down, I was like, I can't breathe. And I would sit up. And now I'm like, I can't breathe. I can't see. I can't breathe. I can't see. And then I was like, Dr. Silas. And he was like, what? I was like, I'm dying. No, you're not. I was like, oh, of course he's not going to listen to me. <laughs> you know, in my eyes, of course he's not listening to me. And then I, I, I remember I was holding onto the rail like this and I, I turned over and I looked at a coworker. I don't know who it was because I couldn't see. It was more like I could see peripherally, but I couldn't see dead on. And I looked at her and I said, again, I'm dying. And then they're like, FSC, like all this stuff was happening at the same time. FSC got put in. I heard Alex's heart rate. And I just was like, oh my God, no. Oh my God, no. Like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And they were like, hands and knees. And I was like, I can't, like I could, I had no energy. I couldn't do it. So surgeon Danielle got me on hands and knees and I heard Alex's heart rate. And he was like, Nicolette, if we can't get this back up, we have to go back to the OR. And I don't remember if I said it out loud because I felt like I was screaming it, but I probably wasn't. It was probably in my head. I just was like, no, 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 no. And he, I don't know, waited 30 seconds and it was like, 
tu 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 and he was like that's it pull the cords we're going and i remember hearing i mean i've been part of stat c sections i know the chaos behind it yeah but being in it like you're the patient like i'm hearing cords getting pulled out I'm I'm sitting up like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe if I lay down. I can't see if I'm laying down, like like all these things. And they ran me the short, that short run to the OR straight back. And so I know certain things. Like they called a code nine on my son. And the sound of that alarm is like whenever I hear that alarm, even before this happened with Alec, it just sends you chills because you know that baby is not good. And They rolled me in, I guess, in the middle of all that, like as they were rolling me in, they called in one of the residents, Sebastian, who just happened to be standing outside the OR, like, it's one of ours. You got to come in. It's one of ours, one of ours. And they're screaming, it's one of ours. And I roll in and my doctor's standing there waiting for me. And I remember reaching out to him, but he like backed up because he was sterile. Obviously, like, don't touch me. I'm sterile. But I reached out to him and I was like, help me, help me. And he kind of was like, I'm good. I got it. I'm going to do her C-section. Like, it's fine. And the same thing. I'm like, I can't breathe. I can't see. And they went to lay me down. And they were trying to like, they were they were having a quick con. The anesthesiologist, Dr. Shroyle, he is amazing. He did the epidural for my daughter 10 years ago before I ever was a labor and delivery nurse. But I got it on video. So I have proof that he was my anesthesiologist and that epidural was amazing. I didn't feel nothing. <laughs> like, it was great. So, him, I mean, I, I literally planned even when he was going to be on. I was like, Dr. Lempel is going to deliver me on the 24th. Dr. Shrile is going to be my anesthesiologist. And it just was so <laughs> planned, but not even in a way that, like, I had control over. It was something else controlling. and. They had a conversation like spinal, like, you know, um, and my doctor was like, knock her out. Like, sh- sh- we have to get the baby out. And so they lay me down. And I just remember like the lights over me and they like pull my arms to the side and I pull my arms back and they shut up. And I was like, I can't breathe. And I'm like screaming. And they lay me down again. Like, I can't breathe. And I spent and I, I will always have guilt over this. Because I knew what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to lay down and I was supposed to let them put me under general so they can get my baby out because his life depended on it. But my survival instinct took over and I just wanted to live. And every time they laid me down, all that weight from that blood that was inside of me was pressing on my lungs. I mean, and again, we still didn't know what what it was. So finally, Danielle got really close to me and she was like, Nicolette, please, like, please lay down. You have to lay down. You have to do this for Alec. And I just looked at her and I was like, oh, my God, Alec. And I'm, then I'm like, how much time has it been? And then I was like, he's dead. There's no way he survived this. He's dead. Like it has been longer than 10 minutes. Like he, if he is not dead, he is severely brain damaged and he is not going to make it. And I just gave in. And there was no peace that came over me that people say that you have when you are ready to die or whatever. I had no peace. I I had nothing. I felt nothing. There were times where I would feel like that tingly, like sleep feels so good right now. I should just close my eyes and just go to sleep because that's what my body's telling me to do. And I would be like, no, like, I, no, I'm not going to sleep. I am like awake. Like I, I'm here. I'm not going to die. Like, no, this isn't happening to me. This isn't happening to me. My daughter, my daughter, I was so worried about my daughter. Um, and when the, when I finally laid down and they put the mask over me, the last thought that I had was, how is my daughter going to live without me? 
How is she going to go through her life without me? And how is she going to live without ever knowing her brother? And then I heard my OB say, she was afraid this was going to happen. And that was the last thing. And then I was, I was gone. If I was alive, if I was dead, I, I wouldn't have known. I was just in blackness. I didn't have peace. I didn't see a light. I just was like, this is, this is death. It's nothing. It's a black abyss. And I am just floating here in the blackness. Whatever it is. So I'm out. I don't know what's going on. I'm intubated. Um, this is now being, this was all told to me through my coworkers at the OR. Cause, and then shift change also happened in the middle of my surgeries too. So day shift left and then night shift came on. And my night shift girl said that they knew something was wrong. They just woke up and they felt like I need to get to work because we haven't heard anything from Nicolette. And it wouldn't like, she would definitely send us a picture of Alex straight out the badge to like, you know, like we've been waiting for this boy. So they just knew and they came on unit and it was like, Okay, guys, Jeff Tuttle, remember not to go into anybody's charts, patient privacy, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, where are they saying that? What is wrong with Nicolette? They came on. My room was still decorated. I mean, it. they got bits and pieces of what happened. It was horrible. Like, my coworkers were in the perinatal loss room in the fetal position crying. Like, it just was so wrong. It was so opposite of everything that we had talked about and how it was supposed to be and they did really great like being there for my sister and being there for surge so my sister tells me surge is checked out dr lumpel comes out he's talking and surge is just gone mentally he is just gone and my ob realized it very quickly and turned to my sister and was like i'm gonna talk to you and she was like, okay, you know, her son has had, my nephew has had brain cancer. She's been in and out of the doctors. So she has a good way of being the person that's steady and, and calm and like, okay, what's the plan? Like, tell me A, B, C, D, you know, and just keeping it in order because Serge was just completely at a loss. Um, when he, so to speak to Dr. Lumpel's incredible skills, first time of first incision, so that would be like outer layer of skin, was 420. And the time of birth was 420. So he got my son out in under a minute from when he was, when I finally stopped and he cut, my son was out in under one minute. Wow. My son came out. And this is the part that always gets me. Like I can talk about it when I talk about him. It just gets me so worked up because I've seen babies like this. So I didn't have to be awake to know what my son looked like because I've had these deliveries. My son came out and he was pale, limp, and making zero respiratory effort. He had a heart rate, so they gave him an APGAR of one. But he wasn't breathing. He, they did PPV, so they just kind of put positive pressure ventilation like on him. And it's kind of like a psych out, like, so his heart responded in like an overshoot. So it went from like 70 to 170, 180. And they made the decision to, he met the criteria for cooling. Um, so they had to intubate him. And... One of the um, the charge nurse in the OR took his first picture because nobody was back there. They had to work so quickly. I mean, they, they got Serge ready to come back, but then they never came for him. And I can't imagine what that must have felt like for him. I've dressed so many dads for C-sections and they have that nervous, like, I'm going to meet my kid, like, oh my God, like right now, you know, and not, probably not the way I anticipated, but I'm still going to meet my baby and it's going to be amazing. And he was just like, is my wife alive? Is my baby alive? Like, so once when he made the incision, he said that two liters of blood just poured out of my stomach, just poured out. And he immediately knew that it was not an OB issue. So as soon as he got Alec out and handed him off to NICU, he called trauma. 
trauma page went overhead. And I noticed my sister was like, I heard like trauma something, something. And I didn't realize it was you until I saw people run into the OR, like a lot of fucking people just running into the OR. And I was like, what the hell is going on? Dr. Lumpel comes out, tells my sister, now this, I, this is my sister's telling me this. I, I cut her open and all this blood poured out. And I just, I just don't know. I, I don't know what is happening. I don't, she just won't stop bleeding. And I don't know if she's going to make it. And my sister was like, what about Alec? And he was like, my job is to get the baby out. And that's what I did. And he is with the people that he needs to be with right now. And she was like, what the fuck does that mean? Don't bullshit me. And he was like, I, I don't I don't know if they're going to make it. I just don't know. And my sister started making the phone calls. We don't know what's going on. It's not looking good. Like she just was in pain and they rushed her back and she was so pale and she's bleeding internally. They don't know where it's coming from. Surge is gone, checked out completely. And trauma came within two to three minutes. And I, I made it a point, like the reason why I say I work at a level one trauma center, it mattered. It saved my life. It saved my son's life. Having a level four NICU, we have, have the best of the best working at my hospital and we have the best technology. The, clo- the next closest hospital that does Arctic sun cooling is in Pennsylvania. It's CHOP Hospital. So can you imagine if I delivered and then my son had to be flown six hours away to another hospital? And I'm in this hospital, like, I can't even fathom. And I know that happens to people. And I don't know, I don't know how they do it. It just takes a different kind of strength that I'm not sure I have. Um, <clears throat> so they're working on Alec. I guess at some point, you know, they, Alec's going to the NICU. He's intubated. He's in the isolate. They're taking him and they come out and surge goes with them to NICU, which he had a really hard time with because I'm always like, with the baby, go with the baby, go with the baby, you know, like any delivery, go with the baby. But it's hard, right? Like, sure, yeah. you love your baby, but you, he's been with me for almost 19 years. He knows me. He's loved me. We've been through things. We have a child together. So he's like, he doesn't want to leave me. So he's torn between two, two people that he loves so much. But he knows, go with the baby. <laughs> So he went with the baby. Um, trauma came and cut me up from where my C-section was all the way up around my belly button up to like my belly button, like three finger widths up toward my belly button and opened me up. And off my operative note, it says when they opened me up, there was like another like two liter giant blood clot sitting in my abdomen. They could not find the source of the bleed. I wouldn't stop. And they had to stop and resuscitate me, but not in the way like I didn't code. I didn't go into DIC. I don't know how these things didn't happen to me because I was on the way. I was trending all the way down. Like my labs were so bad. I was a step away from kidney failure. Like I just did not have the blood in my body to work my body. And off the operative note, it said that they were packing my stomach to try to absorb the blood. And then you would think like you pack it and then you take it out and then you could kind of see where the bleed's coming from. But it was just like everywhere. And so they resuscitated me like they had to get my blood pressure up. So they would give like pressers and stuff to psych my blood pressure into going up. Um, the resident I told you about, Sebastian. Um, he is like a genius. I don't know. He's amazing. He's amazing. He's standing there and he says, this turns me of a case study I read on a woman from my country in Lebanon. Check her spleen. 
and they go to my spleen and my artery is looks like a bomb went off and I'm bleeding profusely from there. Trauma surgeon said the splenic artery puts out something like two liters a minute. And I don't know how I'm not dead. Um, they did what they had to do. They took my spleen because unfortunately, I guess in an emergency situation, you don't really care about rerouting blood flow to a spleen and people can live without a spleen. So they took my spleen. I lost the tail end of my pancreas. And then I was still bleeding and I wound up having some retro peritoneal bleeding, which is just like bleeding that was coming from the back area. And it was just some, I guess, some blood vessels just ripped off my stomach from like the sheer force of my artery rupturing. So at some point during my pregnancy, I had developed a splenic artery aneurysm. And it's not something that I'd even knew could happen to a pregnant woman. And as hard as it is to relive these details, I have to let people know that this is a risk. I mean, it's so rare to survive. When I was told the statistics, I was I got like physically ill and then also felt really weird because I was like, why us? Yeah. Why did we survive? So splenic artery aneurysm rupture in pregnancy holds a 75% mortality rate in mothers. In babies, it holds a 95% mortality rate. So I figured my son was going to die. It's 5%. I couldn't be that blessed, lucky, fortunate, like, there's no way. Look at what happened to me, right? So these are all the things that are happening, and I'm, I'm, I'm intubated, and I, I came out, and, and they called. My sister called Serge. My OB had come out to my sister. I was like, listen, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to get done to your sister that she's not going to like. And like, like, I didn't get my T-Zap, I didn't get my flu shot. You know, I'm like, no, 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 I, I'm healthy. I don't need these things. Like, you're not doing this. You're not doing that. I consented to blood. Obviously, I want to live. Um, But there was like, they have to take my spleen. They have to do this. They have to do that. And um, at one point, my coworkers thought that they were going to take my uterus because they thought maybe it was something, but they didn't. I still have my uterus. Um, There's a picture of me intubated on the ventilator. They put me on because uh, I had respiratory depression because of the extreme blood loss and the metabolic acidosis that I went into and my lactic acid was through the roof. Um, So I guess at some point I just stopped. Like I I just couldn't breathe on my own. So they put me on the ventilator and they came out and my sister told Dr. Lampel, I don't give a fuck what you got to do. You saved my sister's life and I will ask her for forgiveness later. That's it. Save her. And they did. And they put me, they they wheeled me out. And from what I was told, like my, my coworkers were around me and Serge was around me. And I'm assuming he was crying because he can't not talk to me about that day, like at all. He just can't yeah. talk about it. Um, and he followed me to take you, trauma ICU. I struggled for a long time because I was like, how could I just give up like that? How could I just surrender to death? I have a daughter who has been living for nine years. Like, how can I just give up? And my coworkers was like, girl, you did not give up. You were fighting. Like, we had to ask the nurse if they should give you more sedation because you, your eyes were rolling. You were trying to open your eyes. You were squeezing my fingers. You were moaning in pain. You were answering surge. Like, you were aware you were fighting so hard. You are fighting. So they were like, I wish, I wish I would have took a video so you could see how hard you were fighting. So Serge had said that he had asked me if I wanted him to stay with me or go to the NICU with Alec and that I shook my head for him to go to the NICU with Alec and that I started crying. And like, I don't remember. I have a tube down my throat. I'm on a ventilator. I'm sedated. I don't remember any of that. But I was like, 
That's right. I have fun giving up. I, don't, I thought I gave up. I didn't give up. It's me. I am spicy. I am spicy. I am from Brooklyn. I do not give up. <laughs> That's like, thank you for that. I needed to hear that because I struggled with that for a long time. You know, like, how could I just let go of my daughter like that? Yeah. Um, it was really funny because my coworkers were like, yeah, the, the ICU nurse was like, you can talk to her. She can hear you, but she won't respond. And as soon as they started talking to me, I'm rolling my eyes. I'm like, my hands are moving. And they're like, yeah, right. You don't respond. You just don't like her. <laughs> so, you know, they were like talking to me and all this stuff. And then they got to the point where they're like, do you think she needs more sedation? And they were, and the doctor came and was like, you guys need to leave because you are riling her up and you, she needs to rest and you need to get out. Um, the story was I'd be intubated for, and on the ventilator for weeks and in the hospital for months and that the road to recovery was going to be really long and really hard. Um, and I, you know, wouldn't not believe that. <laughs> um, I heard things like, babe, my mom and my sister are coming on Friday. I heard in the blackness. I heard the nurse say magnesium. And I thought to myself, oh my fucking God, I'm a man. What happened? Like my blood pressure died. I didn't have preeclampsia. Why am I not, not going to be able to eat? I'm not going to be able to eat. And I'm like, intubated to date. And this is what's going on in my head. I'm not going to be able to eat. Um, I felt my... I felt my trauma nurse pumping my breasts, which I was like, oh, my God, they're doing that. That's great. You know, because I had a C-section, so I, I need to pump. And I felt someone do a fundal on me, which it was real painful, like painful enough that I was sedated and I felt that. Um, and then I woke up. Holy and shit. And I was like. immediately dissociated from my pregnancy i had to think like oh i was here to have a baby and i'm like oh i have a lot of pain i should just go back to sleep because you know that sedation feels so good you're tingly it's like the best sleep of your life and i was like i just want to go back i don't even want to deal with this right now i just want to go back to sleep but once my brain started like connecting and i was becoming more aware i was like what the fuck is going where am I and I went to scream for help even though I knew I was intubated because I could feel like my throat was hurting while I was sedated like I was like I'm intubated what the heck you know um I didn't think that I would still got intubated because obviously I didn't know the extent of what had happened um it was dark at some point, someone had taken my contacts out of my eyeballs because I had my contacts in. But I remember waking up and take you not being able to see what's three feet, three, three even inches in front of me because my vision is so horrible. Um, I'm like, where is the call bell? So I'm like, you know, sleep band. I'm just kind of like, I'm kind of like reaching because I, I tried to say help. And obviously I, like, I couldn't. I was like, nothing was coming out. And now I'm fighting against this ventilator like this machine is breathing for me, but I am breathing on my own. And I'm like, I can't find the call bell. Maybe it's by my head. So I go to pick my hand up and then it's like, and it doesn't move. And I'm like, I'm restrained. And I have my other hand and I'm restrained and I'm like, oh my God. And then the panic, the claustrophobia, the panic, the anxiety, everything started hitting me. And I remember like, okay, if I move my arms, the side rails will like make noise. But like I had the most quiet hospital bed in like the whole hospital because nothing was moving. And I mean, I I pulled at these restraints so hard that there are pictures of me in the NICU with bruises on my arm because I I had superhuman strength at pulling them. And then I was like, oh my God, how am I gonna get somebody into this room? I'm panicking. So then I was like, I'm gonna bite the tube. So I bit down on my tube and it like created like pressure inside. So then the alarm started going crazy and then like everybody ran in. I was like, oh, thank God. I'm so happy to see these people. And I'm like, like, take it out. Like, take it out now. But I'm like, <laughs> and they're like, mm -hmm, we got to wait. We got to call the doctor. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, this needs to come out right now. So I'm like, I need paper. I need paper to write. Like, let me wait. So they get me paper and I go to write and it's like, did I have a stroke? 
because I, I remember feeling like I couldn't hold the pen. And then once I held the pen, it was like I couldn't translate what I was thinking onto the paper. And I was like, real quick, like, did I have an AFE? Like, what the hell happened to me? And then finally, I just like, I was just so weak and like disoriented. And then I was able to start writing and I was like, please take this tube out of me. Like my anxiety is through the roof. I need this out. I'm gagging. I'm in pain, like all this stuff. And they're like, we have to deflate the cup. We have to wait 45 minutes to see that you are able to breathe on your own. We can't just extubate you. And I'm like, yes, you can. I'm good. Like here, look at me. Like I'm breathing. You're like, get this out of me. Um, But there's protocol. So check this out. The, the trauma surgeon's name was, not the trauma surgeon that operated on me because I was at a mind fuck at that moment. Um, this, they switched shifts while everything happened because I wound up waking up. They said weeks, but my surgery ended at like four something at night. So I was in a four hour surgery or eight something at night. And I woke up at like almost 4 a.m. So I just woke up a few hours later. And oh. so it, so shift changed. So another trauma surgeon came in and his name was Dr. Machete. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I am butcher. <laughs> and I was like, why is this man in my room? Dr. Machete, like, no kidding. You <laughs> got me up like, oh my God. And I was like freaking out. But he's like, we're going to resedate her. And I was like, like put my hands like this, my eyes are like this big, like this man is not Reese's Day. Like, I am awake and I need to know what happened. So they, you know, the nurses were talking, well, pretty alert. She's pretty with it. Like we should just do it. Um, I started to get really worked up, you know, pain, anxiety, my blood pressure started rising and I was gagging. Like I have this tube down my throat. I'm like, oh! and then I have pain in my stomach. Like it was awful. And the nurse, her name was Jill. She said, I don't know where you got to go in your head, but you need to go there because they're going to resedate you if we can't get your vitals under control. And I remember like, I don't have time to think about my son. I don't have time to think about Serge. I don't have time to think about Mina. I need to get this tube out of my mouth. So as I'm like going off to La La Land and trying to calm myself down, Dr. Machete is like, this is what happened to you. And I'm like, okay. Like I'm thinking to myself, like it just didn't make, I didn't subscribe to it. I was like, yeah, okay. That's crazy. <laughs> like, why would that happen to me? And I was like my son. And he said, your son is in the NICU and the NICU will come and talk to you. So I was like, okay, so my son is on life support and they're going to tell me that my son is dead. So I was instantly separated from him in my mind because I couldn't handle that right now. So that went in a box. I'm a nurse. I can dissociate. I deliver babies that are not living. And then I go deliver living babies. I can dissociate and get through what I need to get through. And... They excavated me, which, by the way, I do not recommend. Zero out of 10. Very painful. Not a good time. Um, and then I don't know if, if you guys remember the men's warehouse commercials. The guy who's like, you're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. Like, that's what I sounded like. <laughs> so the first thing I said when I was like, my husband. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, I sound like a man. <laughs> and they were like, do you want us to call him? And I was like, yes. And then all these things just started running through my mind like, what did I look like the last time he saw me? I probably had this tube in my mouth. I probably was sedated. And oh my God, default. What do my eyebrows look like? Do my eyebrows, is my makeup still on? Like what? Because I was so worried. Like I know already that I have this E-section scar and then I have this scar all the way at my stomach. Like now I'm like, okay, I have to preserve this. I have to preserve, like I don't want him to come in and see me like a mess because I can only imagine what he already saw. So. Instantly, as soon as I woke up, it was about protecting other people's feelings. I'm okay. I'm here. It's fine. Everything's fine. Are you okay? You know, whatever. 
So they're like, do you want us to call your husband? And I'm like, yes. Wait, how are my eyebrows? And they looked at me and they're like, oh my God, girls, your eyebrow looks so good. We was commenting on your eyebrows. They're so great. And your nails look so good. We were like, oh my God, look at her. Look at her manicure. It's so cute. You know, like all this stuff. They were like freaking out over it. And I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. My eyebrow, my eyebrow, my <laughs> mascara. And they're like, it's still on. It's still on. I don't know how the tape didn't take it off. Everything is still on. I was like, cool. Call my husband. <laughs> so he, he walks in and I see his face and I, I just looked at him and I was, I just started crying. I was like, do you know what I look like? Do you know what they did to me? And he was like, it's just a scar. It's just a scar. You're here. You're alive. It's just a scar. You're beautiful. And then it's like reality started sinking in. Like this is real fucked up and I'm in a lot of pain and I don't know what's going on. And he was like, do you want to see a picture of Alec? And I was like, nope, I don't. And he was like, why? And I was like, well, I don't want to cry because it's going to hurt. But the reality is I just didn't want to see him because I didn't want to feel love because he, in my mind, was dead. So they called him. My first phone call was to my sister, who I was supposed to deliver Alec on the 24th. She was going to go home. And then the 25th in the morning, she was taking her son for brain surgery. So I looked at the time and it was already like five in the morning. I said, Monique is on her way to the hospital. I said, call Monique. So he calls. She answers the phone. She's like, hello. I'm like, hey, Mo. And there was silence. And I was like, it's your sister. And she's like, oh, my God. I'm so happy to hear your voice. Because when she left, she didn't want to leave, but she had to leave. When she left, she didn't know if I was going to make it. She didn't know anything. So she was like, this is exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you so much for calling me. Um, I'm about to walk into the hospital, you know, whatever, whatever. So then she started, you know, she started posting updates, like she let everybody know what was happening to me. Please pray for my sister. Pray pray for my family. Like, pray, pray, pray. Um, My second phone call was to my dad. And he answered. And I'm like, hey, dad, I'm really sorry I ruined your birthday. (laughs) And he was like, oh, my God. No, baby. No, it's okay. I love you. I love you. And then the third phone call was to my mom. And she was just like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm so happy to hear your voice. The fourth phone call was to my friends downstairs. And Melissa picked up and she's like, labor and delivery. This is Melissa. I was like, Melissa? And she was like, yeah. I was like, it's Nicolette. And she was like, quiet. And she was like, Nicolette? I said, yeah, bitch, I'm awake. <laughs> She's like, wake up, wake up, wake up. And all my, all, my, all my coworkers came up and they were just like, oh my God, Glenn. They were like hugging me and they were crying. And it was, it was like really, really overwhelming. Because, you know, obviously, you know that something horrible happened, but I wasn't ready and prepared to deal with it at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was so disoriented. Like, what day is it? Like, oh, it's next day. Okay. Um, this kind of sucks. Like, I don't know when I'm going to see Alec and I have to breastfeed and I have to do all these things. And they're trying to feed me pain meds. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm breastfeeding. I'm not taking that. And they're like, you need to take these. Pain. I'm like, no, no, I don't. I'm not taking it. I am breastfeeding. Like, do you know what just happened to me? I need to breastfeed my son. I need to bond with him. He is in the NICU. He needs my clotrim. I was like forcing this breastfeeding issue so hard. Um, and then they were like, Nikki's coming. They're going to talk to you. But Serge had left. I think I told him to go to Nina or to the, I don't remember exactly. But he wound up leaving. And I wound up calling one of my coworkers to come stay with me because I was like, I don't know if I'm going to not remember this or I'm not going to hear or I'm not going to have the strength to ask the proper questions. So can you please stay with me? And my coworker Ari came. And she stayed with me when NICU came and they started telling me about Alec. And they were like, Alec is in the NICU. When he was born, he wasn't breathing on his own. So we had to intubate him. When we started brain cooling on him, so we had to cool him down, bring his temperature down. He's on fentanyl, he's on morphine so that he's comfortable. 
And I'm like, okay, so now my son is going to have a predisposition to be a drug addict. Like, what the hell? You know, like I'm th- I'm thinking just wild thoughts. And they said he was seizing. So we had to stop his seizures. And then I like didn't really hear what they said after that because I felt like pieces of me were being taken away. Like you took my spleen, you took part of my pancreas, you took my birth, like not them, you know, like this, this, this entity that was birth trauma, this splenic artery aneurysm um, that I think my coworkers named it Tim or Tom or some like fucking Tim, you know, like, (laughs) um, you took all these things from me. You took away, well, it was supposed to be this beautiful birthing experience, one of like the second best day of my life. And now you're taking my son away from me. Like, I just didn't want to hear it anymore because I was like, what is next? What are they going to tell me next? He's brain dead. Like he was seizing. He's in cooling. Like, so I'm just kind of like, okay, when I need to see my daughter. And they're like, well, you know, visitors under 12 aren't allowed. I said, well, I don't care. I need to see my daughter. I said, because I don't, I don't know if my son is going to live and I need her to meet her brother before he dies. So I don't care who you have to call, but you're getting my daughter in this hospital. Life is an Alan Dina, <laughs> you know, like I just like, uh, but at my hospital is an amazing program called Child Life and they have amazing people working there. And a lot of coordination was going on to get my daughter to the hospital. Um, baked really, really hard. Um, and even my coworkers worked really hard to get my sister into the NICU because they weren't going to allow her to see Alec. And she was like, I am her sister. I am her medical caretaker right now. Her husband is incapacitated. I am coming into the NICU to meet my nephew. And like my charge nurse is spoke to charge nurses. So it, it happened. It happened. So she got, you know, she got to see him before she left the hospital. Um, the doctors were coming in because I was screaming in pain. I mean, I guys, I've never, and I never want to ever feel the kind of pain that I was in. It was like, I couldn't breathe. I had to hyperventilate because the pain was so intense. And I still, I still was refusing the pain. <laughs> like I still was, I don't know who I thought I was. But I was I was screaming and Serge was crying and he was like, I don't know how to help you. Like, let me help you. Like, what, what do I do? How am I supposed to help you? Like, please, please stop screaming. Please, please, please stop crying. Like, just tell me how to help you. And I just was like, <laughs> like screaming, screaming. And they were coming in. They were like, Nicolette, you need to take the pain meds. I was like, I used to breastfeed. I used to breastfeed. I used to breastfeed. And then I think they just like really had enough of my shit. They came in and I remember seeing the look on the doctor's face. I'm like, she's going to lay me out. <laughs> she's going to lay me out. I know she is. And she looked at me and she said, Nicolette, if you don't take this pain medicine, you are not going to be able to go see your son. And I just looked at her and I was like, this bitch. She pulled the sun card on me. And I looked at her and I just said, I don't give a fuck anymore. Just give me whatever the fuck you're going to give me. I don't care anymore. I am in so much pain. I begged God to kill me. I was like, you should have just killed me. Because this, I can't do that. I'm not strong enough. I was screaming at the ceiling. I said, I'm not strong enough for this. Just kill me. Just kill me. I can't take it. It's too much pain. It's too much. I can't do this. I can't do this. And Serge was like crying like, no, babe, please, please stop, please. And they came in and they started the pain meds and it took so long. It was plain catch up. I did not. I did not get to see Alec until the 20. So he was born on the 24th. I wasn't awake for his birth. I didn't see him. 25th, they were catching up with my pain. The 26th was where I was in a spot where like I was in pain, but I wasn't hysterical. You get to go see your son. And I was rolled into the NICU. And he was extubated. He got extubated a few hours after I was extubated because he is my little wolf. He is a fighter. 
just like me. And but he did still have like a they were doing TPN on him and he had like a, a tube going into his stomach and he was sedated and he was shivering. And I remember looking at him like, God, he doesn't look nothing like Mina. Are we sure that this is our son? And Serge is like, it's our son. And I'm like, I, I wasn't awake when he was born and you weren't back there. So like, we can't actually be a hundred percent sure that this is our son. So bonding issue. My coworker was like, Nicolette, it is your son. I was there. I saw him be born. I matched the bands. I put them on you. I put it on Alec. This is your son. And then it was like, oh my gosh, well, if this is my son, like, he's in the NICU. My son is in the NICU. I am a NICU mom. Like, this is the biggest nurse curse that could have ever happened. Like, this is the worst thing. This is the worst thing. And I remember crying and just like stroking him. Like, it's mama. It's mama. I'm here. It's mama. And he just... He was sedated. Like, he didn't know I'm there, wasn't there. Ironic that the podcast called The Golden Hour because I didn't get it. It was ripped from me. It was stolen from me. Um, I didn't get to do skin to skin with him for days because he was cooling. He was rewarmed on the 20th. 24th. And then 24 to 25, 25 to 26, 26 to 27. So he's rewarmed it on the 27th and that's the first time I got to do skin to skin with him because even when I was touching him they were like you have to put gloves on you have gel nail polish on and I was like (laughs) like I want to touch my son I don't want to glove touch my son and then at some point you know the head of NICU was like take your mask off take your gloves off like touch your son um he was a I say he was a big boy, but he was seven seven. He wasn't really that big, but he looked so big being in the NICU, everything's so small compared to him. Mm-hmm. He had the blondest hair. And Mina was born with like a head of dark hair, you know? So like to see that I had a blonde, I mean, and she's blonde now and Serge is blonde. So it's like not a shocker that my kid would be blonde, but like I was expecting to see Mina again. And it was nothing like Mina. He was this chunky boy with this blonde hair and he had this huge butt chin and i was like i I guess that is my son like that's your chin and that's your chin i'm sorry i guess that's our son um the first day that i got to see him was the day that mina got to come to the hospital and she got to meet him um the first day i got to see him rewarmed and i got to do skin to skin with him was the first time that mina got to see him um, and that was, you know, obviously not the way I wanted her to meet her brother, but it is what it is. And it was just so heartwarming to see my kids together and and see that he was like rewarmed and he was so alert. It was like he was born on that day because now his eyes were finally open and he was looking around with these big giant. My coworker said his eyes looked like they were on high alert. <laughs> they were like so big. And he was just looking around everywhere, looking and just like healthy and it didn't make sense because it's the contrary to everything that I was being told and they were like we're going to do an MRI day five to see what's going on with the brain if there was any any brain damage because the point of cooling is to like slow everything down prevent any further damage if damage had been done in the meantime they had transferred me to women. So I was in TICU. I don't even know where TICU is in my hospital. Like I know how to get to the staff parking back, cafe, cafeteria, the morgue, unfortunately. And like, I don't know where TICU is, but they transferred me from TICU to women's, which was on the fourth floor. I'm on the first floor, L&D. Nikki's on the second, HRP's on the third. Women's is on the fourth. So I went to the fourth. Fifth and sixth is postpartum. I was supposed to go to postpartum. Postpartum's like, Did you say a JP drain? Sorry, we're not taking her. We don't care. She had a baby. We're not taking her. We're not taking her. So postpartum, I never wound up going to postpartum. I stayed on the women's unit, um, which is just like G1 man. My doctor came to see me. My OB came to see me the next day, Friday, after his office hours. 
And he came in and he looked at me and he was like, I shouldn't even be talking to you right now because you're not supposed to be awake. And I was like, oh, well, you know me. You tell me to do something. I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> I see like that. <laughs> and he was like, I want you to tell me what you remember. And I was like, I remember everything. And he was like, I want you to tell me. So I told him everything that I told you guys. And he was like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't remember that. I was like, but I do. And he was like, but you should have had some sort of like retro amnesia from the anesthesia. I said, but I don't. I remember everything. And it is a blessing and a curse because I've had a year in between this incident. And it hasn't been a year from my darkest moments, but it's been a year from this incident. So I have a lot of space in between it and me now. And my head is clearer and I, I do have a better, I am in a better place mentally. Um, but the cruel thing is that I remember everything and the first couple of months of Alex's life, I barely remember because you're in that birth trauma fog and your mental health is suffering in the, in the meantime, and you're struggling with your identity and who you are as a mom and a person, like everything. So at that point, I was like, I remember everything. And I was remembering everything. And then now there are things from the hospital that I don't remember because of all the pain meds and being in and out of consciousness. I wound up developing a large abdominal infection from the exploratory laparotomy that they did on me, which isn't uncommon from the type of surgery that I had. So I had one JP drain like right in the middle. And they said, and I swear I get so angry. I told trauma, I think I'm getting an infection. And they said, no, you're fine. And I said, hmm. I can smell like my drain. Like I could smell the inside of my body and it, it smells like I'm getting an infection. You're fine. I'm like, but look at it. It looks a little red and a little, little white puffy. I think I'm getting an infection. They're like, no, 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 everything's okay. I'm like, Okay. Three days later, two, three days later, my white blood cells are through the roof. Uh, the JP drain wasn't really like putting out much, but then all of a sudden it was putting out stuff that looked like chocolate milk and the chocolate ice cream that I was eating. So I was, I'm not eating anymore. <laughs> and that'd be this. Um, they sent me for a CT. The CT came back, large abdominal infection. I need to go to surgery. My pancreas is leaking. They need to put a stent. All these things. But before they tell me this, my nurse walks in and she's like, got all this stuff with her. And I'm like, what is that? And she's like, oh, it's the antibiotics for your procedure. And I was like, what procedure? And she's like, they didn't come in and talk to you? I said, no, nobody came in to talk to me. And she started hanging the antibiotic. And I was like, listen. No, it's not your fault. I'm a nurse too. I know it's not your fault, but you are not fucking running that until somebody comes in here and tells me what the fuck is going on. So she was like, okay, went out. Eventually they came in. Yeah, so you got this infection. We think your pancreas is leaking. Your amylase tested high, which indicates that. So we want to do procedure, put the stent in. I'm like, are you going to put me to sleep? And they're like, yeah. And I burst into tears and they're like, going on i'm like the last time i got put under general i did not know if i was going to wake up i was dying when i got put under general like I, i'm a person you can't just i just almost died and now you're putting me in a situation where i was in when i was dying like what don't you understand about that I advocated so hard for myself. It was disgusting because I, as a nurse, have knowledge and I was being treated like I didn't. So I can only imagine how difficult it is for patients that do not have the knowledge and do not advocate for themselves or do not have somebody to advocate for them. Um, trauma told my OB to stay in his lane because he was calling them because of things that I was saying. And they were like, this is not part of your care anymore. She had the baby. It's over. Like, know your role. And when that happened, it just was fighting all the fucking time. 
And people were like, you're so strong. You're so strong and you're so brave and you're all these things. And it's like, I could look back at it now and say like, I did have a type of strength to pull myself out from the darkness that I was into where I am now. But at that time, I was not strong. I have a daughter. I have a son. I don't have a choice to do what I'm doing right now. That has nothing to do with being strong. I was scared. I was weak. Nobody was listening to me. All I was doing was fighting. I fought for my life. I fought for my son's life. I fought to wake up. I fought to get exhibited. I fought to see my son. I fought to see my daughter. I'm fighting for these doctors to listen to me. All I did was fight. And I did not feel strong. I felt, I felt really weak and helpless. And I felt like a body in a room with an effort. And I never would treat my patients like this. Ever. Because I'm yeah. like, that could be my mom. That could be my sister. That could be my best friend. That could be my daughter. That could be my husband. That can be, you know, like never. No matter how infuriating the patient is, it's like, this could, this is someone's family member. I would argue with these doctors and I, I'm like, I'm not trying to tell you like I know more than you, but what I do know more than you is my body. And it's literally like, okay, you told me I had the infection. I said, oh my God, so funny because I remember telling you two days ago that I was getting infection. You told me I was fine. So that's a couple of days of treatment that I missed. And you are delaying my discharge home to get home to my daughter who was like going to be on spring break. And I was like, the babies are going to bond. It's going to be so beautiful. I'm going to be home with them. I was in the hospital because, not just because, but partly because I wasn't being listened to. And they put me on an antibiotic. I had no idea that I was allergic to this antibiotic. I've never had this antibiotic in my whole entire life. My mom was in from New Orleans and I was like in and out of consciousness all day. Like the pain, I was just real fucked up that day. And the pain meds, like, I mean, I was falling asleep in the middle of conversations. Like I'm sitting here and I'm like, yeah. And I conk out. When oh they God. started the antibiotic, the antibiotic is called aridipenum. It's a heavy hitter. They were like, you know, you'll go home. You'll have a min because they have to place a midline because all my veins collapsed. I just had such severe blood loss that like they couldn't they couldn't start IV on me, so they started a midline, and eventually that stopped giving blood too. <laughs> so I had to keep getting folks, and it was like really really frustrating. Um, with the midline, you'll just have the one antibiotic, and it'll be easy when you go home to do. So I was like, okay, I'm okay. So they ran it over thirty minutes. As soon as the infusion started, I was like, ah, Serge was like, what's wrong? I was like, I don't know. My stomach hurts. Like, cause I, I get gastritis where I get, I've had, I get stomach aches since I'm nine months old. And it's usually just either stress or something I ate, like a lot of pickles or a lot of olives, or I can't have spicy food, you know, things like that. Um, I'm like, I feel like I'm having a gastritis attack. And I like, look at the antibiotic infusing. And I just like, didn't put two and two together at that moment. I was like, why would that be upsetting my stomach? Like, why would my stomach hurt if it's going in IV? Like I didn't eat anything. Like I just didn't, I just, at that time was like, this doesn't make sense, but I don't really feel great. And then I was like passing out, but Serge didn't think anything of it because I had been doing that all day. At some point, I don't remember. He said that I was like, oh, get this food away from me. I'm going to throw up. Like I was just so like not myself. And then I had asked him if he made the AC like colder because I was shivering. And he was like, no, I don't remember. that. I remember waking up around 11 o'clock at night. Now, the antibiotic is done infusing for hours already. But I woke up because I was like, I'm going to shit on myself. And I have not like been to the bathroom. Like it's really hard for me to get up and like all this stuff. I'm pouring sweat, like buckets dripping out of me. Serge got me up to the bathroom. I can't. I went to the bathroom, got up, went to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom like five times. I had like really bad diarrhea and I was real nauseous. I was afraid of throwing up because of all of the incisions that I had. And I called the nurse and I said, something's not right. Something is wrong. I don't feel good. 
I was sitting off the edge of the bed, like my hands like this on on the on the side table. Sweat was like bouncing off the floor from me. My blankets were like soaking wet. And she's like, I'm gonna call the doctor. The doctor's like, I don't know, there's nothing I could do. Like she's fine, whatever, whatever. But then I guess like my muse score for like sepsis like went up. So they called a rapid on me. And I told them, I said, I feel like I'm dying again. And it made complete sense to me that I was dying. I just went through a major surgery, lost organs, had massive blood loss. I'm forcing my body to pump. My body's giving up on me. It can't handle it. And I said, I can't believe that I survived that to die for to die from this antibiotic. Cause I immediately was like, I'm having, I'm having an allergic reaction to this antibiotic. I remember saying, I feel like I'm having a heart attack. And my mother had a heart attack when she was 50. And I had all the symptoms that women get when they have heart attacks. Indigestion, diarrhea, nausea. I didn't vomit because they gave me Zofran, praise the Lord, because I did not want to vomit. And sweating, diaphoresis. And I and I never saw the 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 person that responded to rapid response, I never saw his face because I could not pick my head up. And I was like, are you going to do an EKG on me? And he was like, why would I do an EKG on you? I said, because I'm presenting with all the symptoms that women present with when they had a heart attack and I just almost lost my life. Why wouldn't you do an EKG on me? You're healthy. You're like the youngest person on the unit. We're not going to do an EKG on you. So they did an EKG on me. And I remember like, nobody's going to be able to see this, but you pick your finger, your knuckles together. And if you just like rub your knuckles, like this friction, I felt my heart do that. And I thought I was, that's it. That's a heart attack. You know, like it just like did this and I was waiting to die, but I didn't. And I was like, I think I'm having an allergic reaction to the antibiotic. So eventually at some point I started to feel better. The nurse came in in the morning and I was like, I am so sorry for how I was acting last night. Like that wasn't my, something was really wrong. And I was not myself. Like, I'm sorry if I seemed like angry or short with you. I just, I didn't want to throw up. So I didn't want to talk. And I was just talking really fast. And I just felt like no one was listening to me. And she was like, I'm really sorry because I tried really hard to call the doctor to get them in. And and they just didn't want to come. And I was like, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, trauma comes in and they're like, oh, how was your first night on Earth to Penham? I'm like, did you read my chart? He's like, no. I'm like, maybe you should go out and read my chart and then come back in here and ask me how my night was. So then the whole team came in and they were like, we do not believe that you are having an allergic reaction. We believe that you are developing C. diff. And I started to laugh. I'm like, C. diff? Oh yes. my God. You had diarrhea. I said, yeah, I had diarrhea five times within an hour and I haven't shit since midnight. I'm like, it is eight o'clock in the morning. I do not have C. diff. Well, we're going to ask you to do a stool sample. I'm like, I'm not giving you a stool sample because I don't have C. diff. Because if you believed I had C. diff, why am I not on precautions? C. diff is contagious. Y'all are just walking in here like I don't have C. diff. So I was really stubborn and I never gave them. (laughs) I never gave them a stool sample because I did not have C. diff. I infectious they so they were like we're gonna we're going to do a second dose on you tonight and i was like i um really don't want to feel like that again so i i don't want it they're like we will run it at a slower rate so i was kind of like okay well maybe maybe it just went in too fast like maybe a slower rate will help later that day infectious disease came comes in thank you dr wheeler because he was like, how was your night on air dependent? And I said, oh, they didn't tell you? And he's like, no. I said, you didn't talk to that? He said, no. I'm like, well, I think I had an allergic reaction to it. He was like, well, what happened? So I started to tell him. He didn't even let me finish my story. He was like, no. You experienced a severe central nervous system allergic reaction. We are not putting you back on this medication again. Like, it can kill you. And I was like, that's good to know because that's what I said. And they told me I had C. diff. (laughs) 
And he was like, I'm going to talk to them. We're, we're not doing this. We're not doing this. So I'm like, OK, cool. All right. Another medical condition I didn't know I had. Perfect. Great. Um, so he saved my life there. Uh, I had in order to be discharged, I had to not take IV pain meds for one day. And it was like really, really hard because I was walking and, you know, I had my talk about your dignity going out the window. Like I had my tax showering me because I couldn't shower myself. I had three. I went for that surgery and they wound up putting two additional drains in my abdomen. So I had now three drains hanging out of me, like one like here in between my rib, which was like the worst, most painful one. Like I I will for months like this because I, I couldn't stand up straight because I was in so much pain. Um, and then I had one here and then another one down here. And I couldn't, I couldn't wipe my own ass because you don't even realize the muscles you use in your stomach to just reach behind and wipe your ass. You know, you don't know what you use until you have to use it and you can't. Um, it was really... I felt degrading, but my texts were amazing. Uh, Grandma Marta, I called her because she took care of me. And I cried when I asked her, like I told her, I said, I have to go to the bathroom. And she was like, okay. And I was like, I have to poop. And she was like, okay. And I was like, I can't, I can't wipe myself. Like it hurts a lot when I, I try to reach and she was like okay and I was like mm, I know it's not okay like you're gonna clean my butt <laughs> the shit on my butt <laughs> so where 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 I was like poo <laughs> it's poo <laughs> and she's like it's okay and I started crying and she said why are you crying it's just me it's okay I am here to help you and it's like I'm not the nurse anymore I am the patient and I felt very old and broken and disabled and that is not who I was a few days ago. And I went to the bathroom and I called her in and she was cleaning me up and I was sobbing. And I am so grateful for her because she did everything she could for me to maintain my dignity, but it just was gone. Um, the first time she got me up and I saw my reflection in the mirror, I just didn't recognize who I was well like I saw me and I was like that's my face but like who am I here like my eyes were just someone else like you can't knock on death's door and come out looking the same my soul just looked beaten down my eyes were just like you see my eyes are like these bright blue eyes but when I looked at myself I just saw like black sorrow hollow empty lost like I was dead I looked dead but I was alive and I didn't recognize myself and I hadn't recognized myself recognized myself for a really really long time for that Alec was discharged on day six and was given a clean bill of health. And he did have follow-ups with cardiology and neurology. Um, he was cleared by everybody. He was able to stay in the room with me for an extra week. We just had to sign paperwork where we were like, okay, we're aware that the nurses aren't going to take care of Alec. If something happens, he has to go to the emergency room. And I wasn't allowed to be alone with him because I couldn't take care of myself. So I couldn't take care of him. So if Serge had to leave, somebody had to be there with me. And I had such an amazing support system. When I say like my community showed up for me, they showed up, my coworkers, my friends, family, like I was so supported. People I don't even know were praying for us. And my sister had made a GoFundMe. People were donating like crazy because I mean, NICU stay, hospitalization, it just no work. Serge was out of work, like to try to take care of me. I needed a home health nurse. It, it was a lot. But, um, my coworker started a meal train for me. I mean, everybody showed up for me. And I didn't even know that 
that many people liked me. You know, I didn't even know that I I affected that many people. Like I just come to work and I try to be nice and do my job and go home. And everybody was in my room. I mean, like they my room was full of people and the phone calls and just the love and the prayers and how incredibly supported I felt. I will never forget that. I will never forget the people that showed up for me. And they still continue to show up for me. Um, I didn't know that many people loved us, loved my son. And it, and it is so hard. I don't have a big enough word for how it makes me feel. Um, coming home was weird. I remember getting out of the car and like in my neighborhood and seeing the trees was the first thing I noticed. And I was like, holy shit, like I could have never seen trees again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. Tune in next week for part three of Nicolette's story as she talks about her postpartum. We'll link Nicolette's socials in the show notes to connect with her. Follow Natalie and I as well for more mom content. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please share it with a friend and give us a five-star rating and review. See you next episode.